So uh, we'll get started with the acquisitions of Work for Roundtable. Uh, before we get started, just wanted to yet again thank our sponsors. So we have Evergreen Community Development Initiative for the platform sponsor. So thank you for sponsoring Hopin to make this conference possible. And Mobius is also sponsoring for captioning, which will be available for this track, um, well, this session in particular as well. So I'll post something in the chat for that. Um, this is recorded, so it will be available on the community YouTube in a few weeks post-conference. If you have any questions, uh, you can post them in chat, and there's also a Q&A section too, which might be easier for tracking things. Uh, this seems to be more of a discussion-led sort of session, so uh, either way, I'll also moderate and make sure that you get all the questions that you need. So welcome, Sarah Angela and Jennifer, and take it away when you're ready. Thanks, Gina. So thanks everyone for joining us for this session. Um, if you are on the acquisitions mailing list, you might have seen that this session just kind of came out of a discussion there. So um, our plan today is to just have a, a discussion about different acquisitions workflows being used at two different libraries. Um, as we talk about things, especially after um, our acquisitions um, interest group discussions last hour, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. So like Gina said, feel free to put your um, questions in the chat box or Q&A. We'll keep an eye on that. And then hopefully we'll also have time at the end um, of our discussion just to take additional questions and, and continue talking about acquisitions. Awesome. So with that, I'm going to be the question asker. <laughs> and um, Jennifer and Sarah are going to tell us a bit about how uh, their libraries are using acquisitions. So let's just um, start there. Um, I guess we'll start with Jennifer first. Um, can you tell us all a bit about your organization and how long you've been using the acquisitions model? And your audio cut out, yeah. so she'll restart. So, so I guess I can start while you can start, sir. Your audio. Um, that seems like this is par for the course. For <laughs> um, so I am a member of. Evergreen, Indiana. Um, our, my library is the Hudson Mayfield Memorial Public Library, and um, we have been using acquisitions for almost two and a half years now. So we started at the beginning of 2019. Oh, okay. Awesome. So re relatively new to using the module, but Yes. Some good experience yes, there. and I'll add that we didn't we did not use acquisitions before this at our library. We're new to the module and new to uh, ILS acquisitions. Jennifer, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, so my name is Jennifer Pringle. I'm the training lead and help desk specialist for the BC Libraries Cooperative. Um, we serve members across Canada uh, with multiple services, one of which is our instance of Evergreen. Um, our consortium right now is 101 uh, public, post-secondary, K-12, government, medical, and special libraries of varying sizes from BC, Manitoba, and Ontario. And we currently have uh, 25 public and post-secondary libraries that use the acquisitions module. Um, and we're on the other end of the spectrum uh, from Sarah's library. Um, our first acquisitions library started using acquisitions in the summer of 2011, which was on Evergreen 2.0 and was the brand new um, acquisitions module. That's really amazing when um, you really must have been some of the first libraries using the acquisitions module. That's I believe they were the very first to actually yeah. use it. Very cool. So we have seen all it across. Of our involved in that. Yeah. <laughs> Jennifer, you can give us the long view of where where the module has has come from. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's nice to have these two different perspectives, like a lot, an organization that's been using it since its inception and, and a newer organization as well. All right. Um, so let's talk a bit about workflows. How do your libraries manage ordering? Are you doing any centralized ordering? Or especially for Sitka, does everyone kind of manage things on their own? Um, why don't we start with Jennifer? 
Um, so each of our libraries do their own ordering. Um, while we are a consortium, each library has very uh, local control over uh, how they function. Um, so we don't do any centralized ordering or any centralized cataloging, um, though we do li uh, liaise with um, some of the vendors on behalf of our libraries or in assistance to our libraries. Um, we do centralized loading of full records from two of our vendors as part of our enhanced on-order records and shelf-ready option that they can uh, opt into. Um, and we also do uh, centralized loading of on-order records for our non-acquisitions um, libraries. That's cool. So for, um, for us, also in Evergreen, Indiana, we do not centralize um, cataloging or ordering. Um, it's all by library. And so my library, so we order just for my library, which is currently one branch, but is soon going to be multiple branches. And um, we have a little bit of centralization in terms of some items and with uh, a lot of electronic um, resources being records being loaded centrally. But for physical items, it's all library by library. Okay, interesting. So for both of your organizations, everyone is doing their own ordering, but you do still have some workflows for like shared e-resources and, and the shelf-ready items, which is always an interesting question. Um, those are being loaded centrally, just because that has the potential to, to affect everyone and provide access to everyone. Um, and I, one thing about the acquisitions module in Evergreen, I think, is that it, it is very flexible. That gives us a lot of these different workflow options, which leads to some of the, uh, the questions and the complications that we see. But once you can get your workflow nailed down um, and you can kind of you can translate that into all the different options in Evergreen, um, there really are a different way, a lot of different ways that we can manage that either for central ordering or kind of individually as well. Yeah, and we've found that our training has really evolved over the years. Um, when we started, we trained on everything. And now, you know, we train on the pieces that we know the libraries will actually use, which is a lot less overwhelming for them. <laughs> yeah, that's a really great idea. Um, because there are all of those different different workflow options. Um, sometimes it's it's good enough just to know don't click load item order records. In the last session. All right, so talked a little bit about how you are managing your ordering. What about the actual workflow itself? Um, can you give us an example of kind of just a typical ordering workflow for your libraries? And kind of within that question is always a big question of whether you use EDI. So uh, we have multiple vendors set up for EDI. Um, and we strongly encourage our libraries to use holding data. So any of their vendors that will supply them with holding data, um, we strongly encourage them to get that set up. Um, and in Evergreen, you can actually let Evergreen use any tag or subfield for all of the different providers you have. Um, but we've actually standardized that in uh, Sitka um, and we tell our libraries all to use this, uh, the 970, and then we lay out what subfields they should use um, because we find that makes it so much easier for troubleshooting um, if everybody's order information is in the same field. Um, and especially since, you know, when you're loading files through the load mark order record screen, um, if it doesn't like something in the mark record, all it gives you is ACK import error. It doesn't give you any information about what it actually doesn't like. Um, so for our actual workflow, typically um, our libraries will create a card on their vendor's website. Um, if the vendor does holdings data, they'll then be able to select templates to apply to those items. 
um, and then they can download the MARC records from their vendor website, upload those into Evergreen. Um, we recommend that they don't go back and delete the cart on their vendor's website until after they've successfully loaded the file into Evergreen, uh, just in case they need to go back and download it again. Um, but once they've uh, loaded it successfully, they have their purchase order, they need to go back and delete that from their vendor website um, so that they don't end up with uh, an order coming through EDI and an order coming through the vendor website. Um, we recommend strongly against activating or loading items as part of the upload process. Um, so once the purchase order has been created, uh, they go in, check to see if everything looks all right, um, add any additional info, um, and then activate their order. Um, and then libraries that are ordering from non-EDI uh, vendors will be manually creating purchase orders, um, usually using uh, the ViewPlace order function through the catalog um, or brief records um, directly in the purchase order. Those are, you have some really great best practices embedded in, in your workflow there, like you know Thank when you. to delete your cart, um, it just gives you a good double check on whether or not something's been loaded. But I especially like um, having the consistent holdings tag and holdings subfield. If you just have one mapping, even if you're dealing with multiple libraries, if you have one mapping to keep track of, that's going to help immensely in terms of troubleshooting. I really like that idea. Sarah, what about at your library? What's your typical ordering workflow like? So very similar. Um, we uh, we have some vendors that we have EDI set up with, and we have a, uh, so two our two main two of our main vendors we have EDI set up with, and then basically everything else we um, don't have EDI, but we still any time it's possible we get um, mark records with item information from the vendor and load them into Evergreen. Um, to provide on order records and to track spending. Um, it, with the variety of vendors, it varies where sometimes they can provide mark records, but it's not item information. We have like a very small number of vendors where you can't even get mark records, which is mainly Amazon. <laughs> Um, and then those we have to go in and build the purchase order item by item, which is very annoying, but you know, it's Amazon, so you do what you do. Um, and then, so with the EDI um, vendors, we create the cart on the vendor website, download the, uh, download the carts, load them into Evergreen, um, agree strongly not to load with copies and not to activate your order when you're loading the records because it's just it's too many it it makes your mistakes so much harder to undo <laughs> and there's always going to be mistakes so um, then uh, I review the carts and um, I apply a lot of information within Evergreen using the distributions um, and that and then once I have everything set up then activate the orders. Um, we do not delete our carts from the vendor websites. Um, so that was really an interesting idea. Um, with us, for us we find it useful to have the carts because you can go to orders in the vendor website that way, which is sometimes helpful. And with one of our vendors, they actually they actually use the carts. Like even though we have EDI set up, they still like to have their the website carts. So um, we don't delete those. But I do like the idea of you of standardizing your item information and I might have to look at doing that. Although it would mean going back and changing it with a lot of vendors, which might not be worth the trouble. Thanks. I think, you know, one thing we're hearing from, from both of your libraries is that even when you are using the acquisitions module, because of the variance between the variance between vendors and the variance between the services that your library might be receiving from the different vendors, um, 
you're probably going to have multiple workflows that you're dealing with in the acquisitions module. Um, and then upon whether, whether you're using EI, whether you are getting on order records, um, and whether those records have holdings data in them, all of those things are going to affect what your acquisitions workflow looks like. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So another one question in Q and A. Okay. Um, not sure if you got to this one yet, but uh, those we typically order um, using order uh, vendor records. Sorry, once the order is placed, we get full records from our vendor. Is there a way to overlay the full record over the order record? Yes, uh, I it, I can answer that one. Um, yes, through the mark. Um, batch import uh, function um, and there's some uh, functionality in there which I can't say off the top of my head exactly what you need to select because I don't actually do that part of the process um, but there's some checkboxes in there that actually allow you to say that you're um, you doing things with on order acquisitions copies um, and uh, I think there's also a checkbox there um, so that it looks at the org unit in a way it doesn't if you don't have that checkbox done. Um, and that was something that was uh, really important when we started doing um, the, uh, the loading of the full records with um, the enhanced records or on order records we were getting from our vendors. Um, and yeah, as Gina is uh, showing here, or sorry, and Angela is showing here. Um, you've got that auto overlay in process acquisitions items, um, as well as the uh, use uh, org unit matching uh, copy to determine best match, um, which I think you have to use both of those, but it could just be the auto overlay in process acquisitions items. Um, you do have to receive your on order records first, I believe, so that they have the status of in process. Um, otherwise, they're still on order. Um, I can find more information about that uh, if people are interested. Um, but as I said, that's a, a, piece, a piece of the workflow that I don't actually do. I just know it happens. <laughs> there, and I'm, I didn't see the exact question in the chat box. I think I'm missing it. But there are two different ways that Evergreen can manage item overlay if you're getting shelf ready records with full holdings. Um, Jennifer, you're, you're exactly right with this um, auto overlay and process acquisitions items option. You do need to receive the items first. That status is key to doing the overlay. Um, the other option is to map another um, subfield in the holdings data and you have to configure Evergreen to pass an ID to identify the item to the vendor. They have to send you that ID back. And then when you upload the full records here in the holdings import profile, there's, uh, where is it? Overlay match ID. So you can match on a specific item as well. So there are two different ways to do that. I am listening very carefully to this because this is not something that we currently do, and I have a feeling it's something we're going to want to do when we're opening our new branch. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Batch loading the full records makes a huge difference for us. So now that I've shared my screen, I've lost all of our questions. <laughs> Um, but I'll leave the screen up because there may be other things that we want to take a look at. I apologize, where were we? Um, oh, okay. So we just talked a bit about kind of the typical ordering workflow. One question I had for both of you was whether your library does any ordering for kind of, you know, non-standard or, or non-firm ordering types like blanket orders or standing orders or anything like that. 
So most of our libraries are just doing regular orders. Um, the exceptions that I'm aware of, and there may be things that our libraries are doing that is non-standard that I don't know about. Um, but the ones that I'm aware of is, you know, at the end of the fiscal year, um, some of our libraries will go to their actual bookstore in town um, to spend what they have left in their funds. Um, and in those cases, we tell them just to skip the purchase order step altogether because it's not worth their time to go through and manually create a purchase order for those items. Um, and so instead, they just create invoices using direct charges so that they can say, you know, I spent $200 in the adult fiction, I spent 150 in juvenile fiction. Um, and then when they uh, close that invoice, um, the correct amount of money is uh, taken or spent in their uh, funds. And then they just go through and catalog um, the items as they would any non acquisitions um, items. With, and we, we don't have anything we really do like that. It, we do along those lines, but one sort of non-standard thing we do is um, we order book club kits and so uh, we order materials and then create book club kits with them and so for those things we'll order the items and use the ability to add um, to to not create copies with the purchase order which is really handy because then we can track what we're spending on the book club kits and you know the have the purchase orders in Evergreen, but it doesn't it doesn't create, you know, eight copies of this book when we're actually not going to have any of them. We're just going to have one kit. Okay. Interesting. So I know I've shared my screen now, so now I'm liable to just go rogue and show a bunch of stuff. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, so Sarah, with what you just mentioned, <clears throat> so when you you're still creating a purchase order for those book club items, but are you activating without loading them? the items? Exactly. Then? Awesome. Which I was really excited when I figured that out, that I could do that to, to be able to um, track it that way, because as usually um, those items are being paid for out of a grant. So it's really nice to be able to, to, to track it in Evergreen and see how much we've spent. Cool. That's a really great use case for, for activate without loading items that this option it's, it's not new, but it wasn't there at the very beginning. Um, but that's a really good use for it. And Jennifer, I also like you mentioned just using an invoice to track the purchase. Um, we can still record information like the fund and the title or whatever information, but it's a good way just to leverage the fund tracking in the acquisitions module, which is really one of the big um, reasons why we would want to go um, go through actually implementing the module. And I, I'm seeing in the chat um, that some uh, there's a library that does this for Amazon orders where she creates the records um, but doesn't load the items. And that, like I can see the advantage of doing that. Um, for one thing, the Amazon items come so quickly, like the, ne the necessity of an on order record for those isn't very high. Um, and it could be a quicker way to add all those orders into your system. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, we're already looking at an invoice. Um, so like with most things in Evergreen, there are a few different workflow options for invoicing as well. Um, how do your libraries approach invoicing? What's, what's their typical workflow? Um, Jennifer, you want to start? Uh, yeah, and I just want to apologize for uh, appearing and reappearing, but my sound keeps uh, cutting out. So please let me know if you're not able to hear me at any point. Um, so for our invoices, um, the typical uh, workflow for our libraries um, is that their invoice will come in by EDI. Um, so when the library gets their box, um, they'll have a paper invoice in there, which they can use to find the electronic invoice um, and then uh, check the electronic invoice against the paper invoice and make sure everything 
uh, matches. Um, and that everything that is on the invoice is actually, you know, in the box. <laughs> um, if the library is part of our uh, shelf ready um, libraries, they need to scan one of the items into the item status screen to see what the status of the actual item is. Um, because before they receive an invoice, they need to have those items showing as in process. Um, because that indicates that we've loaded the full records on our end um, for what's in that shipment. Um, if it's still showing as on order, what we tell them to do is wait 48 hours and check again. Um, and then if it's still not showing as in process, um, then they contact us to see if we can figure out uh, what's happening with the records. Um, but currently we load uh, on order records for our non-ACT libraries once a week and the full records for all of our libraries um, on a different day of the week as well. So it's uh, just happening once a week, which is why sometimes uh, they might receive an order uh, before the records are in the system. Um, and then once they've confirmed that uh, the items are ready to uh, be received, uh, we recommend that libraries receive through the invoice as that's the most streamlined, uh, streamlined process. Um, but if libraries want to look at or print the worksheet, they have to go back to the purchase order and some will re receive via the purchase order that way. Um, we'd love to see that worksheet formatted to print via a receipt printer and added to the invoice in the future for a smoother workflow. Um, I think in Bill's session yesterday, it looked like maybe the worksheet was going to be available via a receipt printer with his work. Um, and if so, that's incredible. Um, and then uh, for our libraries that order um, via uh, Amazon or chapters, uh, they have to manually create the invoice from the purchase order they created. Um, and I think some of them as well uh, just go straight from the invoice and uh, don't bother with the purchase order um, for some of those orders. Um, as uh, Tiffany was saying in the chat, So for, for our library, we, um, when we receive the boxes, we usually, we take the print invoice and we go and receive everything in Evergreen. And I'm going to have to take a tip from this and start trying to do it from the Evergreen invoice because that does sound like it would be more efficient efficient, we usually take the purchase order ID number and pull it up and then individually receive those. But of course, then you're looking to find the items on the purchase order. So I'm, I'm going to have, this is a tip I'm taking away. Um, and then we, uh, my um, department doesn't pay the invoices that goes to um, a different department. And so they hate the evergreen <laughs> invoices and they just use the paper ones. <laughs> and so um, we write on the paper invoice what uh, type of format it is, um, and they pay it from the paper invoice. And we make sure that everything is received in Evergreen because that department does look in Evergreen to confirm that the items have all been received. And, and one thing, uh, Sarah, with doing it from the invoice versus the purchase order, which I don't know if it's um, something that happens with your vendors, but for our libraries, the main vendors, um, usually what's on the invoice comes from four or five different purchase orders. Um, right. That which, happens. Well, yeah. a lot of times everything on the purchase order will be from one, everything on the invoice will be from one purchase order, but usually it's not everything from the purchase order. So uh, the invoice, method does sound like it would be more efficient. We Yes, you can also receive and search and scan in via ISBN. Um, and sometimes we do that. Um, but I think when I have a cart of items, I find it's easier to go to the purchase order. And I think I'm going to find it's even easier to go to the invoice. <laughs> Um, but it, because a lot of them will be from the same purchase order and I'll just go down the list on the purchase order and receive the items that I have. If you just have one item, ISBN can be quicker. 
again, lots of different workflow options here. Um, and you know, on the screen being shared right now, this is just an empty invoice. So just to look at it from this perspective since since we're here. Um, this is the empty invoice. If this came in through EDI, it would be all filled out with everything. It's being invoiced at that time. Um, if you don't have EDI, um, you can search for different, um, by a lot of different criteria to find the line items that you want to add to the invoice. And then through this invoicing process, when you click save, what Jennifer was mentioning, in the upper right hand corner, you'll see an option to receive. So that means that you can just invoice and receive right from this same interface, which is nice and, and quick and efficient. So that's a bit about invoicing. Um, what is one thing you wish you had known before your library started using the acquisitions module? So um, as I said at uh, the beginning, um, I believe uh, our first library was the first library to actively use acquisitions in Evergreen. Um, so the one thing I wish I'd known first um, was everything. Um, testing and documenting the acquisitions module in 2.0 and then training that first library was actually the very first thing I did after being hired uh, at the co-op. Um, and while I previously worked at actually used acquisitions before that. Um, so I learned it along with our library. Um, and as uh, you know, Angela has uh, said uh, a couple times, um, the acquisitions module is really complex and it does have a very steep learning curve for libraries that are uh, new to acquisitions. And especially if a library is new to both acquisitions and Evergreen. Um, when one of our libraries opts into acquisitions, uh, the training that we provide now um, is actually about the same number of hours that we do um, when we're migrating a new library. Um, and when we're migrating a new library, that training covers everything else in Evergreen. Um, so we find that we're spending about as much time training just on the acquisitions module as the entirety of Evergreen. Um, but if we don't, or if we're, we find that if we don't do that amount of training, um, then libraries just don't have enough knowledge in this module. And uh, I'm uh, in somewhat of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Ruth says I had this the dubious pleasure of figuring it out, which I had somewhat of that experience where I just had to, uh, as you did, Jennifer, where I had not ever done acquisitions before and there wasn't really anyone to tell me how to do it. it there was, I, I did have a few trainings and thankfully there was the community. So um, when you were starting it, you were just figuring it out. That's to an extent what I had to do when we um, joined Evergreen because we were the first library in Indiana. Um, I pretty much had to learn everything from scratch. So at least there was some knowledge base to start out with, with the, with the acquisition. But um, it, it is a very steep learning curve and um, I'm definitely still learning all the time as I'm learning so much from this presentation. So um, <laughs> now I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> but oh, what, what did I wish I'd known before? So the, one of the things I wish I'd known was that our, our, our department that pays uh, the bills wasn't going to like the evergreen invoicing because they really were pushing for EDI because they thought they were, that would make things easier for them. And so we went through the trouble of setting up EDI with two vendors. It's, it's a lot of trouble to set up EDI. <laughs> And they they don't even they don't even use the invoicing in Evergreen, so I feel like that was a big waste of time, and I wish we hadn't done it. So <laughs> that was the main thing I wish I had known. <laughs> that I, I feel like it um, for my department we get all the in, the benefits that we need from using Evergreen acquisitions without EDI. I'm just as happy with the vendors where I can get records with item information as I am with the EDI vendors. So um, I would say if you don't need EDI, don't do it. 
Sarah, I think you make a good point. There are the the ordering workflow in Evergreen can kind of have varying levels of automation, I'll call it. You if you're if you have very little automation, you might have to you know, manually add all the items to your titles, which which is a lot of work. But I think one of the keys that you're pointing out is that get holdings data in your order records. I think that's a really key piece of making the acquisitions workflow in Evergreen be um, be a time saver for staff. And EDI can definitely be a part of that, but you know that holdings data I think is is a really big key to to making the module um, lead to a more efficient workflow. And Tiffany is just saying in the chat that she tells new libraries that it's far more important to get MARC records than it is to have EDI set up, um, which I think is very true. Um, and with the two main vendors that we have in Canada, um, when we're setting up a new library, we're just going on the assumption that they're going to do holdings data because we have it set up with those libraries to do that. Um, so we don't actually present it as an option. We just mm -hmm. set them up with it. That's nice. And for EDI, if it can add extra convenience to the ordering process, I'll give it a little plug there. But if, if you are planning to implement EDI, definitely plan in extra time for testing with the vendor to make sure that on the evergreen side, you have the attribute sets set up the way they need to be to send the vendor all the information that they need and that they receive it and that when they send messages back, for Evergreen, but they also contain all the information that Evergreen needs on the other side. Um, there's definitely um, some testing that needs to happen there, and it's good to build in that extra time for it. And even if you're um, implementing a new library with a vendor that you already do EDI with, with other libraries, building in that extra time, because all it takes is one piece of information to be wrong or something to have changed and EDI doesn't work for the new library. And it could take a long, a lot of troubleshooting to figure out what that one change was. Exactly, yeah. And actually the same thing, the same advice stands for the mark records and, and holdings data. That holdings data, you know, that's where we put things like the code for the, the owning library, shelving location status, is co uh, fund codes. Those need to be configured on your materials vendor website exactly as they are configured in Evergreen. Otherwise, that mismatch is also going to lead to error messages when you load those records back into Evergreen. Um, so that's another good place for some testing. And my strategy for that is to just have as simple data from the vendor as possible. Um, that when I'm loading the records, I really just care about having the quantity and the price in there. <laughs> Those are the things that I need to track from my spending. And then pretty much everything I apply using the the distributions. And then yeah. that, it's not, it's way less <laughs> trying to make sure everything lines up. But there, but there are a lot of advantages to going through and setting all of that up. And what, because once you have set up, it can be have it set up, it can be a big time saver. Yeah, we have libraries that do shelving location and um, circulation modifier as well as their fund codes in the holdings data. And what we found is that sometimes when a library has been using acquisitions for, you know, a significant amount of time, um, so, you know, it's been quite a while since they set up those templates, you don't remember that if you change a shelving location in Evergreen, you have to tell your vendor that you've changed the shelving location name. Um, so we have a lot of MARC records that fail to load due to a fund code being changed or a shelving location being changed. Um, and then you have to go through and figure out what, it's spot the difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons I just apply that once I've got the stuff in Evergreen and then I don't have to worry about I can change it if I want to, and I don't have to worry about communicating it to the vendor. We've been working on adding it to our documentation so that 
you know, there's reminders in the shelving location section about the fact that if you change your shelving location, it's going to affect your acquisitions. That's really and good idea. Just wanted to chime in to give you uh, 10 minutes, but we do have a couple questions if you're ready to take those. Sure. Okay, so one question is, do any of you use selection lists? Your thoughts and feelings on those? We do not use selection lists. Um, we started off using selection lists back in the beginning and going straight from the purchase order is just so much faster for our libraries. Um, I could see libraries where they have multiple people doing selection through Evergreen where it would make sense. Um, but for our libraries that have multiple selectors involved, they're doing that selection on the vendor's website, not in Evergreen. And I use them, but sort of in a backwards way <laughs> um, that that I'm still using, I'm still just loading records and it, it creates the selection list and the purchase order at the same time. You can do it where you create the selection list and then create the purchase order, but I pretty much do them both simultaneously. And I mostly do that because um, it, it's the, I, I'm, we're on three, four and the searching the purchase orders is such a, a pain. It's nice to have the list to be able to go through and like look at like my recent orders and um, I, so mostly I just use it as a way to access my purchase orders. The question here is do you all find it easier to use the library settings that apply to ACK? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, if uh, you'd like to rewrite your question, uh, I could take that. Uh, we have another one in the meantime. Do your libraries use acquisition module for serial subscriptions? If so, what is the workflow and what does it look like? Uh, if we have any that you do it that way, which I'm not sure off the top of my head that we do, um, I'm pretty sure they would just use invoices to track the funds and, and use the direct purchase or sorry, the direct charges in the invoices. And we're currently not even doing that. I'm not tracking my, my serial spending in Evergreen. I might at some point, cause it's nice to have, I, I really love being able to track my spending in Evergreen, but I don't currently have that set up. Um, so I can see the uh, further information about the library settings in the chat there for holdings info, uh, temp, circ mod, call number, barcode, etc. Um, so we require all of our libraries to use the barcode prefix um, acquisitions library setting um, and that we require that they use their library code um, with an A and I can't remember if we tell them to put the A in front or at the end. Um, to ensure that we're having unique barcodes across the system. Um, and there's a few of other ones that they can use, um, but that's the only one that we tell them you have to use um, this setting. And off the top of my head, I don't even know um, what, what our set, if we, what our settings rules are because I didn't create them. So um, maybe Ruth can talk about that. Uh, but um, we, I know we're using um, automatically created like barcodes and um, on order uh, call numbers. Um, <laughs> Ruth says no. So uh, th those are both, those are both being generated by Evergreen. Um, and um, the, the circ modifier shelving location and fund codes I'm all uh, those are I'm all applying with the uh, distributions <laughs> uh, there's another one which is what seems to be the most typical part of ACK for you and your libraries to learn that's a great question hmm Loading the records, um, that load item checkbox 
causes so many problems coupled with the slowness that causes time timeouts in the um, load mark order records screen. Um, that's where we get the bulk of the tickets from um, is that 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 screen is causing a lot of problems because people um, because it's timing out, they think the purchase order hasn't been created. But if you actually go and search for the purchase order, it's there. Um, so that's our biggest challenge at the moment is just handling that screen um, and dealing with um, what happens uh, when that load Im items uh, is checked and a library does it twice or three times. And I would say that for me, that is that's another place where the selection list comes in handy. Is that um, whenever I I'm not sure if it's loaded or not, I go to my selection list and I can see whether it's been added or not, um, because it just lists them chronologically. And so um, it, it's it's a very easy place to check and see if my if if my load happened. Um, as far as what I feel like was the steepest learning curve, uh, honestly, there's so many moving parts. It's hard to narrow down one thing because there, like, uh, there were speed bumps every step of the way. <laughs> but I guess on a day-to-day on -day basis, loading records is the most challenging thing because it's just easy to introduce errors at that point. The place where I introduce the most errors is that I choose the, the wrong vendor when I'm lo loading my records. And I agree with Sarah, you know, the whole whole of acquisitions together is the steep learning curve. There isn't really one piece of it that stands out as far as training people to use it other than the load mark order records. And that's more just people remembering which settings to choose. And there's a lot of settings on that page, um, which makes me really excited about the um, angularized version that Tiffany demonstrated during the act int interest group, which has templates. Super exciting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I agree that there's lots of moving pieces in the modules put together, but when it comes to the actual workflow, this is the screen to spend some time on before you start using the module or if things aren't happening the way you expect them to. This is kind of the place to go back to as you've loaded your records to see um, you're trying to determine what exactly was selected and, and what it's doing. So I know we're we're getting pretty close on time. Is the session, is it 50 minutes or? Yeah, it's hour? 50 for each. 50. Um, Yes, yeah, so if anyone has, uh, we could probably take one more question for the panel. Yeah, we, I think we did the serial subscriptions already. Well, Jennifer, Sarah, do you have any last minute advice for any libraries that might be thinking about using the acquisitions module or checking it out. I, I would say that as much of a headache as is involved in it, I, I'm really glad that I did it. Um, the the benefits outweigh <laughs> the um, the problems. I, I love having, you know, on order records. I love having um, I love tracking my spending in Evergreen. I that I could for collection management and development purposes, we can create fund codes specific to our collections, which we don't do for accounting. So the library didn't cr track them nearly as granularly as we want to for our department. And so in Evergreen, I was able to set it up so that I can do that. It's great. We can tell how much we spend on a certain collection. It's easy for us to see at a glance if we're um, on track for our spending for the year. Um, it, I, I really love it. And I'd say, you know, 
before you start using acquisitions, make sure that you need to use acquisitions um, because it can be a real time saver, um, but it can also add a lot of extra time if what you actually want is just to have honor records in your system so that your patrons can place bolts on them and you don't actually want to track your funds through acquisitions. Um, we have some small libraries who, you know, they have two staff members and doing all the fund, you know, pieces isn't worth the time for them because they track that separately and it works for them. Um, but with our en enhanced on order records and shelf ready pro uh, project that we did with our um, two main vendors, um, they can get enhanced on order records that have all the holding data that they can load into Evergreen. Uh, well, actually, we do it for them uh, through the Ma uh, Mark Batch import export, and then they have all of their um, on order items in the system uh, without having to manually create them. Um, and for some libraries, that's what they need. Um, so definitely make sure that you want to use and you need to use acquisitions before you start um, because it's a lot of work to get it going. Um, and as we've said, you know, there's a steep learning curve. Um, so if it's, if you're going to turn out to not actually want the functionality, um, it's not worth your time to, uh, to spend all that time on acquisitions if it's not going to be what you need. Um, I'd also say that if you're using acquisitions or even thinking about using acquisitions, um, definitely join the acquisitions uh, email list, um, as well as come to the monthly acquisitions interest group meetings. Um, and don't be afraid to ask questions either on the list or um, in the, the monthly meetings, um, because what you're running into, probably somebody else has run into. Um, and there's lots of people in the Evergreen community who can uh, give you guidance or um, commiserate that they have the same problem that you do. Okay, then. So uh, thank you to our panel, Sarah, Angela, and Jennifer, for spending time to do this uh, ACK workflow roundtable discussion. Um, we have a few more minutes before we go into the next, I'm going to bring my slide up, intro to Launchpad with Taryn uh, in track two. Uh, in the meantime, thanks again so much uh, for the discussion today.